Hi, everybody. This is the uh, presentation, the slide night. Welcome. Um, we are on Zoom and in person, and I'm excited to see everybody's work this week. We got a full house, and the first person is our medals instructor, Stephen KP. To introduce them is Wyatt, the fine medals assistant. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Wyatt NP, and uh, I'm here to introduce the um, instructor for fine metals for this week is uh, Stephen KP. Uh, they're an artist, jeweler, and educator based in Providence, Rhode Island. They're currently a professor at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Uh, KP received their MFA in jewelry and metalsmithing from the Rhode Island uh, School of Design and holds a BFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. KP's studio practice is centered around investigations of empathy, material culture, and queer experience. And KP is very obsessed with uh, their dog, Finnegan, who is very cute. Little dachshund. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Wyatt. Can everybody hear me all right? Um, a little closer? Better? Good. Okay. Um, first off, I want to express an incredible gratitude to Peters Valley for having me. Um, it's an incredible privilege to be talking amongst the trees, the noise, the bird calls, and the insects. It's really special. Um, special thank you to both Talia and Wyatt this week. Um, I'm really excited for our workshop. Um, to reiterate, my name is Stephen KP. I am an artist, jeweler, and educator based in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my practice, my research, and my thinkings towards my work. Um, it's an immense privilege, and it means so much to share my ideas and projects with you. Uh, to begin, I grew up in a small town, which I think is funnily named Random Lake, Wisconsin. <laughs> Random Lake is a town of about 1,500 people during the summer. Um, with more cows than humans, a cheese factory, no grocery store, and everyone knows everything about their, what's happening in the city. Um, as I grew up, my parents worked late and traveled often for their jobs, so I was primarily raised and spent a lot of time with my grandparents, who would pick me up from school, feed me dinner, and often with their very, very thick Yiddish accents, read me bedtime stories. If I wasn't helping my grandma Rosie cook in the kitchen, my weekends and afternoons were spent working alongside my grandfather in his garage wood shop. My grandfather Lou had to learn how to hug me. Um, he was an incredibly gentle soul considering all he had gone through in his life. Lou was a third generation Jewish German carpenter and would often take me along to his work sites. I'd watch him build from foundation to the smallest miter detail um, until a house became somewhere where someone lived, a home. It wasn't really until I was much older that I understood why it was so important to him that I watched and learned. By the time my grandfather made it to America after fleeing the Nazis, he lost any reminder of where he came from that he couldn't carry with him. He was 16 years old when he arrived in New York. He had lost contact with six of his eight siblings and his mother he would never hear from again. He had lost his world and in, arrived in a land where he could barely speak the language, but what he could do was build. Uh, carpentry was the way that he could feed himself and prove his worth in a society that saw a refugee as nothing but a burden. And because of this, my, like many displaced families, my family is without heirlooms. And through that, my grandfather taught me everything I know about woodworking. And I can say that sawdusting, sawdust runs in my blood, but woodworking with my hands is more than that. The lessons from my grandfather and watching him continue to live and exist after what he had gone through taught me a philosophy of making that went beyond just method. Woodworking and wood carving, it's an act of preservation and also communion for me. Wood as material in this process, as many in this audience can attest to, is an incredibly loud uh, voice to converse with. As a tree grows, it collects, it lives, 
Its rings and knots accumulate the events that it witnesses, and its bark is tarnished by the time it endures. What is a storytelling storyteller in its own materiality? It is obvious to say that trees are living, but the wood of their corpses has the scars they collect through life. What is an archive that's catalog has been terminated? Carving back into the block of wood is a way to expose that inherent tension that the material records. Carving is in that way an act of truth. It's uniquely reciprocal. It necessitates acknowledging that agency of what you are carving. But carving is also consequential. It's an act of finality. There's no going back. To return to a state before wounds were impacted on it through my hands, through that gesture. And that's an allowance to move forward, to embrace those errors. It allows forms inherent to the blanks or blocks of material to be released from their entombment and become. It's through these processes I can begin to replace those objects we lost, create rather than destroy lineages, to build and reconnect. Working in carpentry and wood is more than just that familial nostalgia for me. Um, it's a way of holding conversations in a familial language, woodworking, on topics that I would never be able to discuss at my dinner table. When I began this body of work, particularly, I was thinking about trauma, that sort of trauma that comes with being other, um, and the effect of being alienated from where you come from. When made other, a body comes under stress. Space ceases to conform to its presence and movements, the societal structures that are meant to guide, support, limit, confine the conventional body all fail and fall short. And I want to specify that while I'm talking, I'm talking about a queer experience, not only discussing the effects of sexual orientation or gender expression. Queerness in this dialogue is a relationship to power and something that's always relative, shifting, and not easily contained by definition. To pass in this dialogue is to be seen as conventional or the expected. To pass is to not raise alarm. Passing is an allowance to exist without constant fear of retaliation for being your authentic self in a system where that authenticity is antagonistic, undesirable, other, or queer. Passing is a privilege that's really not afforded to all those who may need it in order to survive, but passing is also a practice of potential erasure. If the body blends into its surrounding, it's because it's camouflaging the wounds impacted on it in order to pretend. The passing body is still in this state of otherness, of ongoing inflicted alienation, and that price of passing is to suffer in silence. And it's an inherently alienating experience that our society and our coping mechanisms for trauma have been a huge point of frustration for me um, as I've been thinking, as I've been living. Um, those expectations of closure, of resolution, of moving on, it gets better. And that trauma is in something inherently that we need to undo, undo, get undone. And that's really where the not work became an opportunity for me to explore that sort of, what is the reality of the unending, ongoing nature of living with trauma uh, in a way that allowed me to embrace the tenderness, softness, and slowness that actually working with it requires. When I approach a blank of wood, a block, uh, the knots and their forms are already within them. Something I like to say to my students is all that's left at the end is what we haven't touched. Um, as I spend time with the wood, carving, removing material, refining the surfaces, softening those wounds, those knots lighten and they loosen. I call them partially undone and that's all they can ever be. They are gestures rendered slowly in between being fully tightened and unraveled. They are given the allowance and power of being perpetually unresolved. They are objects of tension that bind nothing in place but their own existence and they will never come undone. My partially undone knots pass as knots, as not wood, until they're handled, until you pick them up. The weight or lack thereof um, defies what's conventionally expected of their darkness, of the drapery of the strands, and it they hold form as they move. They don't sway, they don't 
hold. They're wooden and moving. And that's really only fully understood once they're held in your hands, once you wear them, once you move with them. And carving in this process isn't the terminal point. It's not the end. Um, carving for a piece of wood that has been caring, sorry, caring for a piece of wood that has been handled and shaped is a commitment within itself. Um, my objects don't just need to be worn to perform, but they need to be maintained um, to make sure that the wood doesn't dry, crack, break, age. Um, and there's this beautiful old adage that was passed down to me by my grandfather that in order to take care of a piece of wood, you need to oil it once a day, once, sorry, once an hour for a day, once a day for a week, once a week for a month, once a month for a year, and once a year for a lifetime. There's no necessary moment of resolution, of termination, only development as they are lived with. And this ongoing relationship, it's how we work against that alienation, that othering. It's how we foster connections and how I can allow some tenderness and slowness, some practice care in my studio. It's these reciprocal moments, these give and takes, uh, these relationships and exchanges of dependency that work against isolation. And jewelry as a format is inherently relational. Uh, it's always in relationship to the body it's worn by, in relationship to the environment um, or the situation that it's worn through, and in conversation, of course, with the societal structures in which with it's, a, it's can create it, it's made. Um, and controversial take within a group of artists, um, no matter how impactful or powerful a messenger that a painting is, can always be walked past. A sculpture can be walked around. Jewelry walks up to you. And there's so many pressures, and amongst these pressures that pull and hold us together, gravity, connections, binds, bends, etc. Um, these objects can always go beyond those limitations of our individual experience. Um, my work is a a practice of extreme labor um, in these relatively simple gestures. You know, it's just a line bent over itself, solid, perpetual, but so many hours and time and attention paid in each line and gesture and surface. Um, and matter accumulates its own experiences. M material that's handled, shaped, cared for, it's transformed by these actions. It's, in these objects, these works of art and time, they can act as surrogates and mediators of connection and nourishment when we otherwise feel alone. In the time that I spend with, uh, spent carving a piece, refining its form, it becomes sort of an embodied and condensed block of my time with it. And if that work can then be handed off, held or worn by someone, by you, it can transfer that care. Um, they become devices against that alienation that I was speaking to and towards community. Uh, these past several years, which we've all endured, um, have made the importance of that tactile physical connection, that binding together, sort of impossible to overest overestimate or overstate. Um, these objects are how we can connect, sort of nourish each other, and it pulls us together no matter the distance and no matter that time. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much. All righty, next up is our ceramics instructor, Ava, introducing her is Elizabeth. Hi there. Uh, I'm Elizabeth. I'm one of the ceramics assistants. And Eva Kwong was born in Hong Kong and moved to New York as a teenager. Uh, she received her BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design and her MFA from Tyler School of Art. Her work study job at the Nature Lab at RISD immersed her studies in the diversity and similarity of forms from nature. Her lifelong interest in the intersection of the art and science of the natural world provides the conceptual framework and visual vocabulary for her compelling, colorful, organic forms in sculpture, installations, and vessels. 
Uh, Eva has presented her work in lectures, workshops, and exhibitions uh, throughout the US and all over the world. Please help me welcome Eva. Well, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Po Wen, who helped us out a great deal today. And thank you for Elizabeth and Logan for helping our class and, uh, and for my class, who we have a very energetic, <laughs> cram-filled, busy, busy day. So it's quite wonderful. <laughs> but anyway, I, um, I do a lot of different types of work. So today I only focus on things that I saw glaze. I work in all temperature ranges. I work with all kinds of clay because I've always just been curious. And one of the things I've always sort of have done, once I finished school, I realized I have to be my own teacher. I have to be my own janitor. I have to be my own secretary. I have to be my own classmate. I have to be my own rifle, rival, or, or I have to do like fulfill all those duties, right? Because I'm living by myself or work in my own studio. So I miss that kind of, you know, the, the, the group, you know, the community around us, my classmates, you know, my teachers, other teachers down the, you know, on the different floor, you know, like we have a lot of Ristiites here, you know, going through the Metcalf building was fabulous because on different, each floor, there's something else happening. And there was always something really, something else happening in the studio every day. So I used to go upstairs, downstairs, and check out and that's where why I ended up I think in many ways in ceramics because I love the Metcalf bill it was the most interesting building on campus next to the nature lab but my job in the nature lab um, gave me the foundation it taught me how to see how to look carefully how to observe and not take things for granted because in nature nothing is what it initially seems like and also um, you know something that's what I call industrial symmetry. So this is maybe a small. So an industrial object is generally perfectly symmetrical. You almost don't have to turn it around because you know exactly it looks the exact same way on the other side. But one of the experience in working at the nature lab is that organic symmetry is very different than um, artificial or industrial symmetry. We are symmetrical, but we're different left to right. We're different front to back. So when you, um, one of my jobs at, at the nature lab was to catalog all those objects. So I had to put a catalog number to each thing. So I would have to figure out what's the best spot for it. Or if a catalog, if an object that was borrowed and brought back in, I have to figure out what the where the number is and enter it back in the log that it was returned. She so used it kind of like a learning library. So it impacted the way I look at the world. It impacted the kind of work I do and or my interests and certainly inter, inter, uh, impacted the way I look at color. I happen to have studied with a lot of people from Yale, you know, especially freshman foundation that study with Albers. So I have a lot of interest in that, in the interaction of color. And of course, you know, in years since I have sort of taught on some of that. So I like lots of color and I've always like tried to kind of uh, develop my own colors. So most of this, let's see, I have to, we'll get started. But I've only, only included things that I fire in a salt kiln versus other kinds of firing. And I grew up in two cultures. I speak two languages. So I always feel like I am have two parts of me, but there's probably more. But anyway, there's that's tuck of war, the sense of duality on my pieces. And also um, this is from a series called Opposites Attract. And I was also thinking about having a child and thinking about genetics, like what would um, I contribute to my child? What would my husband contribute to my child? And I also look at what my father, what came from my father, what came from my mother, and what is uh, passed down genetically or physically, or what is passed down um, mentally, right? 
because sometimes you'll say, um, you are just like your uncle Ralph or something, but you've never met uncle Ralph. Is that true or not? Right. But you believe some of those things. So, so you know, both things that are physically trans, uh, transmitted and also things that are transmitted in other ways. So these are all uh, also pieces using painted with color slips. Um, that's also something we're concentrating on this workshop. And I like the color slip because it's really thick. I used to paint a lot with glazes, but I switched over in the 80s with mostly painting with color slip. It has a lot of body. And so you can build up kind of textures and a lot of surfaces. So these are all kind of in the 80s, works from the 80s. Um, this group are kind of smallish for me, you know, they're solid because I was working kind of small at that time and I had all the time in the world, so it took forever to dry. Um, but you can see some of the coloration. The salt brings out the brilliance of the color. And it also, I like it also because it sort of gives an organic quality, what we call orange peel, like an orange. And it's also uneven, which I also really like because I don't like it like super flat. Only human made things are super flat. Nothing in nature is super flat. There's always color rate variation within it. So I like that organic quality. And I like that the colors would change or actually I paint it so that like this is a large sculpture. They're quite built they, about my height, a little shorter. So it gives me a lot of space to put a lot of color on. Okay. All righty. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Our next instructor is Kristen the, in the Wood Studio, and Jason will introduce her. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to introduce Kristen Lear. The mnemonic that she gave me is that her dad's name is Paul. So, Paul Revere, Kristen Lear. She currently resides in Moscow, Idaho, which is close to the border of Canada. It's such a small and assuming town that when she needed a new studio space, she just bought another house down the block. She is not just a woodworker, but she is also an avid frog trainer and recently won a gold medal at the International Bullfrogging Competition in Juneau, Alaska. Please help me welcome Kristen to the stage. Thank you, Jason, who may or may not be a big liar. <laughs> All right, so I'm doing the arrows. Okay. All right, so this week I have the privilege to teach power carving wood, texture, and sculpture. And I, it really is such an incredible uh, privilege to be flown across the country to spend five to seven days with other creatives. Uh, like we're just here to make things. It's this is so unusual. I can't. I, I can't believe my luck and all of our luck. So thanks for sharing it with me. Um, so I've been making sculpture for more than a decade, but um, one thing recently, maybe during quarantine, I started thinking about our planet a little bit more and um, the power carving that I've been doing sculpturally, kind of thinking of it in a new way, in some ways trying to take things that already exist on this planet, like for instance, a kind of hideous serving tray from Goodwill for $3.99 and use the, these skills that I've been working on to kind of transform something that's already there into something that's hopefully be beautiful or has some sort of a um, something to say. So that's sort of a, a new thing for me. All right, Moscow, Idaho is up, up here um, in the green parts, uh, pretty close to Canada. Um, so I live in this part of the country called the Palouse and it's this absolutely stunning, Area. It's one of the most agriculturally rich places in the country and not to brag, but we are the lentil capital of the world. So this is right, right where I live. And just recently, the, we grow a lot of canola and there are these day glow yellow green fields everywhere, just, you know, yards from uh, the, the city limit. So it's fantastic. Um, I love curves and movement, and you'll see that in my work, but certainly I think that um, the landscape where I live really um, has an impression on the work that I make. This is an early uh, piece of mine in, uh, inspired by the hills around me. 
Okay, so if you are from Idaho and you tell somebody asks you what you do and you say you're a wood carver, this is pretty much um, you know across the board. This right, like they look at me like really okay. So um, <laughs> I feel like when they ask what kind of work I do, I pretty much have to pull up my website because I, it's kind of hard to dispel that with the, the I don't know the stumbling language I put around it. So um, I also like Eva. I'm inspired by microbes. I love tentacles and uh, flagella. And so my work is very much not like chainsaw art bears. Um, so whenever I am given an audience like this, I also try um, try to point out that I'm not the only one not making chainsaw art bears. There's just um, a huge amount of really, really beautiful, some conceptual, some very ethereal wood art out there in the world these days. It's kind of, wood's kind of had its, it's kind of having a little bit of of a moment in the last um, 20 years or so. There's gorgeous stuff out there. So the two main loves of my, of my life since I was a tiny kid uh, were art and science. Here I'm bragging again. This is my first published piece of art. It's entitled A Car, and you'll see there's a steering wheel up at the top. That's what, um, and this was published in the newspaper, and I was already getting paid as an artist as a four-year-old. UCI I won $2 for this drawing. So I was always drawing, making stuff, sewing, knitting, you know, all the, all the stuff. But I was also kind of obsessed with um, not scary nature. I'm still a little like the bugs and the ticks and whatever. Anyway, but I love grass and plants. And I was lying with my face down in the grass, looking at the little bugs, the little worlds there. And my mom really paid attention to that aspect of me. And when I was six years old, she signed me up for a microbiology class for kids at a local college. So this honestly was a transformational moment in my life. So I was on a college campus and we scooped water out of this pretty skanky fountain on campus and looked at the drops of water under a microscope. And it, it truly blew my mind that I looked, I looked in the microscope and I see these beautiful things kind of gently flowing in the water. And some of them are like buzzing around madly. And it was the first time I really understood that there are these invisible worlds around me. And I, I mean, this, this really um, kind of started me on a trajectory in my life. So when it came time to go to college, I decided that I was going to study science, and um, I studied bacteriology very seriously. I was I I have a PhD in molecular microbiology, so I'm like, I went down that hole. Um, but and I studied first good bacteria that um, fix nitrogen and self fertilize uh, plants like beans um, and legumes, and then sort of somehow that merged into me studying some really nasty human pathogens. So it was a great career, great first career. If anybody is looking for a first career, it's a good one. But so while I was working um, as a scientist, I still just, I needed balance and I was always making things, whether it was um, sewing or I mean, just sort of anything. I'd go to those you paint pottery places, just whatever. I had to make something or I got a little bit nuts. All right, so how did I go from draw <laughs> drawing the newspaper awarded car to woodworking? And the standard story that most people have is that they had a, a dad, a grandpa, a neighbor, somebody um, who had a wood shop. And I did not have that situation. My dad is a computer engineer. You might be able to tell just from his outfit in this picture. And um, like my woodworking was Tinker Toys when I was a little kid and that was it. So for me, I didn't start working with wood until I was in kind of a tiny bit in college, but mostly in graduate school. And that was because I was poor and I had good taste in furniture and I couldn't afford it. So I went into the university wood shops and they taught me from, you know, first steps how to um, build furniture. That's little baby me. This is in the MIT wood, uh, wood shop and I made a whole bunch of furniture for myself in that place. And then some of the furniture is still in use in my house. There's a bed I made. This is the first bench I ever made. Everything now, I have, I have two kids and we always have dogs and chickens and whatever. So there's like pen mark and stickers. And one of my dogs chewed um, the post of one of the beds. So anyway, there's a lot of love, that furniture. So then how did I get from furniture to sculpture? And that um, has to do with these penguins. So um, I was lucky enough to work with a local artist, a wood artist who is... Um, making really world-class sculpture. 
and I he just he let me come and work in his shop and I was tootling around and um, he was given a job to create a, a very high end artistic kitchen for a local man who'd been um, working many I don't know what you call it, like sessions or seasons in Antarctica and um, my artist friend didn't have time to create the um, custom carved cabinet handles that this man wanted. So he asked me if I would do it. And I said, I don't, I don't know how to carve. I don't know how to do this. And he's like, I'll teach you. So I did it. Um, I took on the job. And then by the end of 23 penguin custom designed and carved cabinet um, pulls, I then knew how to carve wood. I was really sick of penguins for a while, if you can believe it, right? They're so adorable. I love them again, but 23 was a lot. Okay, so how did I go from being a scientist to an artist and in this studio with the whole penguin situation? Um, so I was working in a pharmaceutical company. And then in 2005, my husband got a job as a professor in Moscow, Idaho, and we moved across the country. And it just felt like the right time for me and for our family. So you know, I always loved art and science, and I did science for close to 20 years, and it seemed like it was time to do the art stuff. So we moved to this city cheap enough where you could buy, buy an extra house, right? Um, so this was where it was a big turning point in my life. And um, second career is awesome. It is hard to go from getting paid and having a boss that tells you what to do to being your own boss and not, not getting paid <laughs> regularly, but um, I don't regret a second of it. But one thing I get an awful lot is like how, what, how scientists to an artist, that's not a thing, which we know that it is. I mean, uh, anyhow, it's, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that, um, but I will have to say that it's not that my life before was kind of all bacteria-y and now it's all glamorous and arty. Um, honestly, the wardrobe is very similar. <laughs> and um, there is, and we were wearing these things before COVID, so. Um, also, uh, there was a lot of problem solving and design and thinking in art. A, a lot of people in, in the science realm maybe don't really realize that, but there, there's an awful lot of similarities to how your brain has to work. Um, I mentioned I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I gave a TEDx talk in 2019 called The Art of Science. You can, if you wanted to watch that, you could hear more on my thoughts. But mostly I am presenting the work of I think five or six international artists who are just making unbelievable work at the edge of art and science. So you can just Google my name, rhymes with <laughs> Paul Revere, right? Um, and uh, TEDx and you'll see. It was terrifying. It was the most terrifying thing I've probably ever done. Okay, so when I made that big transition from science to art, I had absolutely zero expectation or guess that my art would, would pull my science into it. But sort of as, as the years um, went on and I was working on my skills, I was really drawn to making things that kind of flow, kind of flagella -y, tentacle -y things. And it just, it all came back. And in retrospect, it makes an awful lot of sense that two things you love, like maybe smash them together. So um, I will show you a number of my science inspired pieces. So there, there's sort of three major um, themes or um, subject matters that my work, um, focuses on, and first I'll talk about science and nature. Some of my work is very overtly related to this. This is clearly a leaf. This is um, a curly tulip leaf. I always love those in the spring. And then I've um, drawn the structure of chlorophyll on the outside of this, so very overt. I generally make a piece at the coming of spring because I love spring, I'm so excited, but no, you can tell what that is. And then like many artists, uh, you know, feathers are great. So a lot of us at some point or other tackle feathers. But then um, my work also can get a little bit more um, impressionistic as far as science goes, um, where I'm, I'm really interested in the concept of movements. And even though I work with a very rigid material of wood, I'm always trying to make it look as if it's sort of in organic motion. It's being kind of um, moved by air or water currents. Um, Th this piece in particular, a number of the ones like this, I kind of early on had this idea that I wanted there to be some ambiguity about whether this was a friendly or a hostile organism. This is when I had young children. So I kind of wanted it to be this beautiful thing that, but you're a little bit like if you touch it, it might try and kill you, especially if you looked at its baby wrong. So that's sort of where this work came from. 
And then my tentacle pieces got a little bit more friendly after that. Um, let's see, th uh, these pieces are made with multiple wood parts. And in my workshop, we're gonna talk about how I connect some of the, um, how we can connect pieces of wood to other pieces of wood that can look invisible or not, depending on what, what you want to do. This name was chosen by somebody on Instagram where I was like, I'm done with this piece. I have no idea what to call it. So somebody said skip and I thought it was a great name. A few more tentacly beasts. And this one, Haggy was actually inspired by our dog who he is, a, he's a very strange, wonderful um, rescue dog with a lot of quirks, but he has very regal posture. And so the um, sort of the posture of this was inspired by him. And this is the real Hagrid and he sleeps in very fascinating poses. Um, Eva mentioned diatoms. You know, sometimes I will use, um, I use microscopic images for inspirations for texture um, in a lot of my work. So this texture was inspired by diatoms, these cool little, they look like um, alien skeleton ghost cages, I love them. Um, this series of work was really, I mean, I would say if there's one thing I'm trying to do with my work is kind of, you know, focus on the fact that this world, everything is so mind-blowingly complex and just astoundingly beautiful. Um, and these pieces, I sort of have the spaces in between them to kind of remind you to look inside. Like anything, if you look at a leaf, oh, it's cool. But then if you know anything about um, structure, you know, there's mitochondria, there's DNA, there, you know, there's subatomic particles. It's this stuff is just fascinating to me. And these pieces were sort of meant to kind of direct the focus inward. Another big theme for me is on connection and protection. Uh, the next few pieces are from a series called Implements for the Protection of the Innocent. And each piece was based on a kind of standard American <laughs> platitude, this one being, um, uh, rise above. There was a certain political period that I had to address with my work. Uh, this one, inspired by patience, is a virtue. This one, by if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, I use leaves often as a symbol of protection, kind of like nurturing protection, um, also sort of healing or regrowth. So I wrap leaves around the home, for instance. Uh, and I use snakes. Um, snakes are symbols of protection in many <laughs> cultures. So I wrap them around other things, again, to symbolize protection. And then um, somehow I make a lot of spoons. This is the first spoon that I ever made. It's made out of a single piece of wood. It's carved and bent. Um, and I made this when my daughter was very young and it sort of imprinted on my mind spoons as symbols of um, kind of, I don't know, like the most important love in um, not the, you know, it's a romantic movie. It's the like, I love you so much that I feed you and I will scoop dog poop and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anyway. Um, so this spoon uh, really got in my mind, um, these as sort of talisman and symbols of family and um, just the deepest love. So here's a number of spoons. Um, I now make them much larger, about a foot and a half tall and uh, make them wall mounted. So they really can be hung as a talisman in people's homes. And spoons have also been a wonderful project for me because they're a real bite-sized piece. Um, uh, not that many years ago, um, my pieces took me months, uh, months and months to make. And a spoon was always something that I could sort of say something, but get it done in a decent amount of time. So I'm gonna finish up there. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great being here with you. Oh, thank you. All righty, next up, we've got our blacksmithing instructor, Andrew Mears. To introduce is Sean. Hey. How's it going, everybody? I'm the blacksmith assistant, Sean. Uh, I'm here to introduce Andrew. Mears, uh, he's one of few words. He wrote his introduction for me and it's about two sentences. So I'll read through and then I'll speak a little extemporaneously. Um, Andrew Mears is an ABS mastersmith and has been a former artisan residence at the National Ornamental Metal Museum, Penland School of Craft. And he currently resides in Western North Carolina. Um, I've had the privilege of taking a class with Andrew. Uh, he's 
really an incredible talent. Um, I learned a lot from him and uh, it was a folding knife class. If you know me, I've made a lot of folding knives since then. And, uh, you know, I got a high standard to try and uh, aim for here. So his work speaks for himself. You'll see it soon. Uh, here he is, Andrew Mears. Good evening. I thought I'd just share a little of my current and past work very briefly. I started my creative career in painting and I do sub I've done subcontracting for design firms, uh, strong flute mechanisms and worked in a dental lab. But currently I make my living selling cutlery. Uh, primarily, I guess my work would be known for pocket knives, folding knives with engraved embellishments and narratives over the surface. This one is a mouse that I tried to trap in my studio. This one's based on a Radio Lab episode uh, about the Tong child. I do a lot of work with Damascus. This is sort of a layout for pattern welding and fusing. This is a, a paperweight that's engraved, traditional Japanese tea ceremony object. Uh, right now, I'm working on pocket knives based on river stones and the way they interact with your hand. This is an example of that and working with selective heat treatment and engraving. Um, I do a lot of, that's my favorite effect is the transition from hard into soft steel. It's created by masking off the steel and quenching it. And I derive the shape from traditional scraper blades that I kind of distilled down and have made into various other shapes. So fall pieces, a little bit of color. I like to play around with forge welding powder material and working with exotics and scraps. These are lithic style pieces that I've been forging out recently, sort of mimic fossils and stone tools. It's a little close up, inclusions of the cable breaking apart. So a little less tight than traditional uh, knife making work. It's a little close up. I do a lot of uh, vessel work. This is a, a traditional incense box. Uh, engraved with an owl, sort of the sketch and the layout, and then etched and patina to bring out the uh, disparate alloys, the finished product. And right now I'm working a lot with manual machining and digital processes to amend that for templates um, is currently my interest right now. And that's it. All righty, thank you so much. Next up, we have the instructor in fibers, Caroline, to introduce is Emilia. Hello, I'm Emilia, the fibers assistant. Um, Caroline Silverman is an artist and writer who works at the intersection of annotation, object, and context. Born in New Newburyport, Massachusetts. She earned her BFA in textiles from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2018 with dual concentrations in literary arts studies and gender, race, and sexuality. I'm not good at reading, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Caroline currently maintains a multidisciplinary studio practice in Brooklyn, New York, and teaches at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. Please help me in welcoming Caroline Silverman. Hi everyone, um, I'm Caroline. Uh, thank you so much, um, Peters Valley for having me. And thank you so much to Emmy and to Amalia for all of your help and support this week. Um, I feel very lucky and privileged to be here with everyone. Um, yeah. Annotation, narrative, and context. Um, I wanted to start today by just reading a brief statement that I wrote about my work. Um, there's a familiarity and a tangibility to our relationship with textiles that stems from human interaction to our environment from moments after birth. These qualities are evident in the need to physically experience the surface of fiber goods and has culminated in the passing down of hand-stitched heirlooms that come from generations before us. Often we inherit the idea of spaces just as we inherit these objects from family. And with these items come details that clue us into their narratives that were left behind, our heritage and even how communication amongst each other has shifted through the decades. 
In the same way that internet commentary captions on family photos or highlighter streaks across printed pages of printed work act as layers of context atop methods of general communication, my work performs the act of annotating a space by claiming ownership over the experience of the object for the viewer. My work exists at this intersection of archival investigation and contemporary sensibility, and I use, excuse me, utilize commonplace objects that are often a part of everyday life to expose the hidden narratives there. So this is a lot of really <laughs> formal language to basically say, I really love thinking about the way that people interact with their surroundings. And I think that textiles are our most immediate surroundings that we can have. Um, so this here, for some context, is the picture of the digital embroidery machine, which is the subject of my class that I teach. And so this is how I've been spending a lot of my time over the last few years, is both using and teaching other people how to use a very high-tech mechanized industrial process of something that is a centuries and global-wide tradition. And so for me, um, I feel really lucky to be at this intersection of thinking about both the rapid mechanized pace of something that is inc incredibly slow and meditative, and then also being able to take that into my own practice and thinking about the inverse side of that coin, um, which for me has looked a lot like these projects over the last few years. This is kind of the other end of my spectrum, which is these hand beaded quilt paintings that I've been working on. Um, and so this is a piece that is a little bit dizzying to look at, but is something that I worked on for a lot of 2020 and a lot of 2021. Um, this is a neon open sign that I hand stitched every bead onto this. Um, the piece is about 36 by 36 inches. So it's quite large. And I spent a lot of time beading this open sign from inside my studio apartment in Brooklyn, really thinking about um, how nothing was open, how everything was closed, but really thinking about longing for that sort of you know, the ability to just like walk into a gas station that has like this neon open sign there um, and to feel safe doing so. And so this piece is called Ghost Hum, um, which refers to the effect of like the neon noise, that like audible sensation and that like buzzing feeling as you're approaching something that is electric in that way. And really this two year long effort that I went through to try and see if I could get that through analog means. Um, I hope it vibrates. Um, almost more important to me than the front of this is the back. And I think that this is really interesting is something that I was not really thinking about at all as I was making the piece. But once it was done, I couldn't help but photograph the backside as well as like an incredible evidence of like this time and this energy that really almost surprised me in terms of like how resonant that felt by the end of um, seeing what this piece looked like. I mean, I love the front, but I think the back to me speaks in a really different way. And um, something else that I think a lot about, uh, as I mentioned with this interest in a space like a gas station, a space that's kind of meant to be ubiquitous in some way that everyone has this experience. It's kind of meant to be a little bit of a beacon on a road trip. It's meant to provide some sort of prepackaged, very chemically comforts. Um, thinking about things like regional snack foods and like the bright, um, like neon orange of like a price tag sticker. Um, I've been experimenting with a lot of these um, pieces of lifted text and imagery and like thinking about what it means to put the front of a chip bag on the inside of a quilt. Um, this is a, a painted and dyed quilt batting. So like the, that kind of like felted cotton that's directly inside the quilt. Um, I really have a thing for neon um, as I have mentioned a little bit. Um, and something that I think about a lot too, kind of with this relationship to annotation and narrative is, you know, the act of like highlighting a book or highlighting a passage that is really resonant to you and thinking about these landscapes that have really strong memories imbued with them and ways to like really paint that landscape with the attention that, you know, you might have looking at it that other people might not perceive. And so these iterations of different landscapes and different unusual circumstances um, are something that I think about a lot in my work. And so this is um, a set of couches from a thrift store that I stumbled across in South Carolina that had the same print on the couch as in my Bubby's living room. 
And when my dad pointed this out to me, because I was too young to remember what her couch looked like, I immediately snapped this photo of it that then became part of my work for several years. And so this is a digital embroidery piece that I did of that couch that was made from this painting that I had first made of this couch. And so something else that is really important in my work is this really long form relationship, this very iterative process of taking the same imagery and reworking it and recoloring it and recontextualizing it again and again and again in different sizes and different textures and different formats. Um, and this idea of like really living with these images and with these pieces. So another piece that I lived with for a great long while is the solstice project that I did um, in 2020, where I decided to make a quilt every day from the summer solstice to the fall equinox. Um, so for the entire duration of that summer. And with this piece, my original intention was to really think about this kind of fleeting nature of like the golden hour or like the fading light of summer. And in the end, it ended up being a very wildly interesting record of um, my own behavioral patterns through like a really intense period of time when we were all at home almost every day. And so I did this for 92 days um, with the exception of two days. Um, you can see here day 12, there is a spot missing. Um, I cut my thumb making dinner. And so I forgot to make a quilt that day. <laughs> and um, there's another day later, the day that Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away that I completely forgot to make one. But I think the evidence, especially seeing them all lined up in chronological order, it starts from the left at the top, goes down and then starts again at the left and goes over, is really seeing the days when I was really engaged in the project and the days where I was definitely um, not as interested in sitting down with my sewing machine for a long period of time but also the patterns of the fabric that kept showing up day after day, or the patterns of how like different sections have really distinct color moods or different days where I really um, decided to like veer off course and remove things rather than add things, or days when I um, didn't actually have my fabric with me and ended up making quilt pages out of napkins. Um, and these are all 12 inches by 12 inches about. And so these are all installed at the yard in Brooklyn. Um, where they were up last summer, um, and there's the missing day. Um, I believe it was day 88. Um, but yeah, so these are all here in order. Um, and again, like this idea of really living with the, these pieces, and they're pieces that I never really even knew how I would photograph them when I was making them, but it felt um, like a really interesting gesture to keep going and to keep making them. And so I mentioned I live in a studio apartment in Brooklyn um, with another person. It's very tight in there. And so this is a typical view of like how a lot of my work is just kind of stored and like a temporary, but what ends up being a kind of long-term way um, until things get finished. I move them around. I layer them on top of each other. Um, I like to look at the color relationships and the texture relationships and really see like what simmers to the surface and this idea of like really living with all of these things and really letting them marinate. Um, and so, yeah, this is um, a very typical view of what everything looks like in my house. Um, and here's a bit of a sneak peek of what I'm working on now. It's another neon sign. It's an ATM sign. Um, for those of you who are in my embroidery workshop, you'll see this tomorrow. And um, you can see that this is my template of where I stitch down all of the letters as a guide so that it can be something that can be folded up in a backpack and flown across the country and re and unpackaged there to be worked on for a couple of hours every night. Um, and so that is what is on the horizon. Um, once again, thank you so much to Peters Valley and my website is here in case anyone wants to take a closer look at anything else. Thank you. All righty. Thank you so much. Last but definitely not least, I lost my mouse again, is Katie Truck, who is the special topics instructor. And I'm here to introduce her. <laughs> so Katie Truck is a multimedia New Jersey based artist and teacher known for her creativity with materials such as pantyhose and wire. She is here to teach the special craft of paper mache and her enthusiasm doesn't disappoint. <laughs> Please welcome Katie. Oh, microphone, the power. Our microphone. 
I'm a loud person, so I usually don't get one. <laughs> so cool. All right. Um, you're looking at my pantyhose work and you're like, what are you doing? You're teaching paper mache. And that's because a lot of people don't want to sit around and sew pantyhose with me. <laughs> so uh, I've been doing paper mache since I was a little girl. And you'll hear more about that. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm showing you a lot of my pantyhose work because that's a lot of the work that I tend to exhibit. And this one is called Up the Decimal because it's a self portrait because this one goes to 11. Anyone spinal tap? Nope. Okay, never mind. Pass. Uh, just like everybody else, uh, at first, when I was in the uh, first grade, I won a poster making contest. And I was, my mom's like, I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an artist. And bam, there you have it. So, uh, and then you can see everybody's like, oh, I get this question all the time. Oh, my pantyhose, what are you doing? And it's this girl. You see this girl? She is to blame. Her name is Jennifer Spielbogel. I do not know where she lives now. And it was the late, it was like the 80s. Yeah, I want to say the 80s. Let's say the 80s. <laughs> and you, women used to wear stir pants. And we used to wear our knee highs, all right? And they were like all like these neon colors. And Jennifer Spielbogel for my birthday gave me like a tube of uh, neon colored pantyhose. And I was like, oh, they're so cool. I can't possibly take them out. And I carried them around for, I kid you not, for years. People I thought it was so weird, but I was like, I can't, I must. And so she's really the reason why I'm obsessed with pantyhose uh, to this day. If you see her, tell her um, hello for me. And you can tell, like, look at me, Tim Grins are in. Yeah, right after that, I shaved my head. Thanks, mom. She was the best that's great. She was like, it's cool. Uh, I, I like to say I'm a retired a ceramicist, okay? I did go to Alfred University. I know, so you're also looking at me like, what is your problem? I know, it was great. I totally loved it, but I got really tired of sharing kills with people that their stuff would, I'm watching my language, that their stuff would explode and take me down with them. And I was like, that is it! And I remember having a box because I was obsessed with downy bottles and I was carrying it across campus and you know, I had to take like multiple breaks. And I was like, why? It's so heavy. Uh, so I started, uh, thankfully, I was allowed to play with like those zillion materials. And I was really into uh, neon and, and glass blowing. And so this is Big Mama. She's about my size. And neon brawn panties. Oh, yeah, Big Mama. You should have seen her ass. Too bad. Uh, I also, my thesis, though, because again, there was nothing worse. We were we did this like big show. And they're like, Katie, will you exhibit some of your neon? I'm like, great. And I got across campus because I didn't have a car. And some of my tubes broke. And I was like, what? Like, like you don't, don't have time to re-bombard a tube, right? That doesn't happen. So I was like, there's gotta be a better way. I gotta be able to do something better. So my thesis was being able to make artwork out of anything. That was the goal. What can I make artwork? And boy, my like instructors, they're like, can you make something out of this truck? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So uh, unfortunately, and I'm all really also into the installations, um, my camera for my senior thesis, uh, I didn't realize because it was the days of slides, uh, it was busted. And so a lot of them didn't come out. <laughs> so this is like one, a terrible picture that I have of, that is paper mache. I was, uh, Alfred is really big hunting and it's also really big on uh, roadkill. And it's, uh, uh, they used to kill their deer and then hang them by the tree. So every fall you'd be like, you know, just walking down the street and being like, dear, dear. It was almost like the, 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 you know, like the trees were instead of apples, they were like dead carcasses of deer, you know, nobody has that problem here. And so I was obviously obsessed with them and was making them out of paper mache and then any material. So um, yeah, that's just one of a really bad image of it. Cause again, um, all right, so when I graduated, it was like really the grunge era, you know, like the whole Courtney Love, some weird lipstick, ow, all right, and I was really obsessed with eggs because here I was in my 20s being, doing everything possible not to get pregnant, right, and my neighbor in the apartment was like trying to get pregnant, and he had testicular cancer, and he wasn't even 30, and I was like, what, like, oh, um, so I used to blow out eggs and then I would put great foam in them and then I'd wrap them in pantyhose and then I would, um, yeah, like you could see like some of them are exploded because it was all about like, um, contamination and obviously I was obsessed with eggs and I would rip it all apart and rip apart the pantyhose. And I started feeling like, oh my God, I'm like doing so much damage. That's not me. I'm not a, like a destroyer. I'm a mender. Okay. So I started sewing the pantyhose and I eventually got tired of a eating eggs and putting eggs in everything. Uh, and also I had a lot of trouble with galleries because they would like look at me. They're like, um, what's up with these eggs? Are they clean? I'm like, yeah, of course they're clean. I blew them out for hours. They're totally fine. 
but they're like, no, 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 we don't trust it. There's going to be a smell or something. I'm like, oh, killing me. So we got to get away from the eggs. Okay, that's fine. So um, I, don't, I take, you know, criticism really well. Um, so this, um, I was working with this artist. It was after 9-11. I had, you know, I was working in, I was in Manhattan. I was a morning show producer. I don't know if you could tell that I could possibly do that. Um, and uh, these people that I work with uh, down like the industrial way, they're like, hey, again, I don't know why. And people give me their garbage. I, I appreciate it. They're like, I've got some old beach fencing. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah, of course I do. And, and this one's hatched. Can you tell I'm getting away from the eggs? <laughs> and that's when I started bringing the pantyhose because you saw on the last one how I was sewing the pantyhose, right? And I finally got into the colors. So this is it. And so now this is more beach fencing. And I was just starting to just use pantyhose. And this is I know I look fabulous because I moisturize all the time, but this was like well over 20 years ago now. <laughs> um, so I also, you know, I'm doing the, the screen, the cages and stuff like that. And I tried to use material. And this is um, uh, women in those days used to wear like these unitards that they'd clasp right at the crotch because like it tucks in the pants, which are coming back in, which I don't understand because if you're in like a stall and you're trying to like kind of like you're bumping your head, it's like the worst invention ever. And I don't understand why, but it makes great artwork because then I have like these, ah, ah, you know, kind of things that were really great. And I love that. Um, as you can tell, I was a Girl Scout. I earned every single one of those badges. Um, so when I say that I worked with Super Mache float season, they'd be like, yo, Katie, can you make me like a Cabbage Patch Kid head? Yeah. And this is pre-college, pre-high school. Okay. Can you make a unicorn? Sure. So I've been working with paper mache and that's why I feel as though I can teach it to you now um, for a really long time. Um, so now these are uh, less, you know, like uh, organic shapes because I was, uh, you know, I was like, I'm out of fencing and somebody's like, how about some reinforcing concrete floor wire? I'm like, okay, thanks. And so these are really big and they're really simplistic. And back in the day, you could only get nude and brown and white and black. So if you wanted any colors, you had to go to the adult stores. <laughs> So I was on Route 10, I live in New Jersey, and I was in one of those like peep shows on me, and I was coming out, my dad's like, I was seeing you moving a pink hose, but they were buttery delicious, but they stretch. And they were the only place you could really get colors. These days, you, I mean, you can get them anywhere now. Let's be real, I can go to Amazon, blah, blah, blah. But in the day, that was the place to go. All right, so um, yeah, Cylind cylinders, my size, and then, I started going through a divorce. I know, surprising, right? <laughs> um, and these are my blah, blah, blah series because, you know, like when you're having something, uh, like when people are telling you, blah, blah, yeah, keep going, blah, blah, blah. Plus when you're not feeling well about yourself or something like that, you're constantly blah, blah, blahing to somebody else. So it's like a reciprocal. So don't think it's all like, you know, I hate you. Why did you take the dog? Um, miniatures. And then I, you know, it, like everything always happens at the same time. You're like, ah, oh, how can I keep creating? I'm an artist. And, and I got kicked out of my studio too. And uh, so I was working miniature. And this is the, my homage to 9-11 uh, because from my apartment, you could see it burning. And that's when I got into teaching is because I know it's a downturn. We'll, we'll pivot, I promise. Um, and that's when uh, I had a lot of, like, there was a voice in my head, like, you got to go teach kids. You got to be hanging out with kids again. And that's what I, I did after that. So let's keep going. Um, my first show was, I call it a new life because it was rebuilding. And so I made pieces that started really small to piece that's like really big. And it's all about garden. I love pantyhose because you can get it now in any style, texture, or anything that you possibly want. Awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm always constantly trying to take this man-made and trying to make it back to organic. And these slivers that you see, it's amazing. I love being last because I'm like, oh, yes, I'm the same. I dig it. I was obsessed with like little pools of water and the microscope and the microcosm. So that's why they're slivers. And to me, they're like little microcosms. Okay. So totally. Is this good? Are we awake now? All right, cool. Um, I always am working on things that are like, what's going on in your mind, Katie, what's going on in your mind? I was, this was when Harry Potter was really like popular and I was having nightmares about Voldemort and snakes. Ah, so um, I don't like to use a lot of pantyhose that already has a print on it 
because I find that it automatically makes you think of something. So I'm constantly trying to remove that. That's why I also remove all my crotches and things like that because I don't want you to go there. Shame on you, I know you did. So that's why I don't. But um, some of these snakes, I'll never forget this woman came up to me. She's like, I was so terrified. I'm like, of, of the snake print? It's camera print. Okay, blue print. Um, a dating again. I have a series called Shot Through the Heart. And there's a way you give love a bad name. Come on. It's a lot of different ways that the heart explodes. Your bullseye, impaled. I've got a, one that's called screwed and another one that's called like implode. Yeah. yeah. Um, whimsy. I find that it's very, for me, all these pieces. And my always my goal is to make a sculpture that is truly three dimensional. So that no matter if you hang it on a wall or if you hang it from the ceiling or if you put it on a pedestal, you can truly view it three-dimensionally because there's nothing worse to me than like, I know I like bases and everything for like sculpture, but I'm like, you know, like I, and I relinquish it. I make it so that you can spin it. You can do whatever you want to. And I leave it to the curator. You want to hang it? Do it. Can I hang it upside down? Do it. I make it so that I'm totally happy with every view. And this is the first piece um, she said it would be whimsical that I was trying to make it almost the same front and back, which to me is really hard because I'm constantly turning the pieces and constantly turning the pieces and I have to. Uh, people are like, do you do drawings before you do them? I'm like, no, because pantyhose sometimes doesn't stretch. And some, and I hate painters. I love you, but I hate you because like you can change your mind. You're like, uh, I don't like yellow anymore, green. And I'm like, if I don't want the yellow, I have to like go back two days, undo it. And put in the other color. So I have to really like, I'm always like, uh, I'm spinning it, I'm turning it, I'm, I'm constantly thinking. My, I'm, I'm just another, my father was, um, he was diagnosed with lung cancer and given a year to live. And I was supposed to make this huge, I was supposed to like decorate and Johnson's and Johnson headquarters in uh, New Brunswick. And I was like, I can't do anything. What am I going to do? So when they give him a year to live, I have this box of scraps. I don't know why. As artists, why we why we keep these things, right? And I had a box of scraps and I just started sewing them because how can we tangibly feel a year? And so I sewed all the scraps and then I broke them into 12 months and then I embellished the months, July and June, you're looking at right now. And then from those scraps, I worked similarly to Caroline uh, for 31 days and made until absolutely fit. everything was done. So the whole show was about tangibly feel, feeling a year, months, 31 days. I saved all the thread, made thread drawings. I did uh, drawing every day for 365 days. It was massive. Um, he was, by the way, he was dating. Who would have thought? He did like one of those like profile pages, like I might die. He was nonstop busy. I call him up and be like, yo, dad, let's get together. He's like, I got a date in New York. I'm like, well, I, you could die. Make some time for your child. He lived another seven years, um, which was awesome. And yeah, uh, it's because he found love again and he's down in Atlanta. He's like, I'm in love. I'm like, I know you are. Um, how do you do big pieces? Uh, it's hard with pantyhose. So I'll tend to do multiples. So you can see me, this is in Patterson. I did uh, some of the art factory. Patterson was great at one point. I say at one point. Uh, it was great to like be able to like put up artwork. They were really very abrasive and stuff like that. And then somebody's like, I don't know if he got drunk or something. He was like, I don't like your green and like ripped it out. And I, and I obviously wasn't there. And I came back. I'm like, what the hell happened? I'm going home. But I do like to do big, I've done window displays. I've done lanterns. You can see. Pantyhose is very Okay. So when everybody always asks me to make them a lamp, I'm like, it won't be bright. <laughs> I know it's fifty. So these actually have a uh, six inch, you know, uh, space. So for the floodlights, and this was in. Uh, I did this for the West Windsor Art Council until they changed um, leadership, and then I saved them from the basement. Uh, installations. I have done installations. I love, obviously, I love installations. My my thesis of senior of like my college, you know, uh, was an installation. It was I did all these, you know bodies and things and you know as you could see from the deer right okay uh remember it wasn't too long ago this one it was for the center of contemporary arts and they wanted me to start at eight feet up and then like stretch the pantyhose across like the whole like thing and th that's the light in the room we're basically looking up and i was like yes, of course, that sounds awesome because i love a challenge and i love you know like when somebody's like have you ever tried i'm like no like, really um 
And I didn't realize as much I was very thankful that everybody donated pantyhose and I will always take donations. I love donations. I'm very thankful. Never take a gift horse in the mouth. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, they donated 15 pounds of pantyhose and my friends, that's a lot of pantyhose, okay, to bring 15 pounds. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing. So I tried, and these days they make pantyhose so that you can't really dye it. In the 70s, and you find a lot of craft books about it, you could boil your pantyhose and then dye them. Not anymore, people. So you'll see a lot of brown, a lot of white, a lot of black, but it was still really beautiful. Um, but I learned that I'm terrified of lights. <laughs> Did I mention that we started the installation eight feet and then up? Did I mention that? So um, I was really very blessed and lucky that there were a lot of uh, volunteers that came and helped me put it up because you know, I got to the top of the ladder. I'm like, <sighs> it would have taken me years. We did this after every time, like their summer camp program, it took a month to put up. And what you don't see is all of my work is very tension driven. And I will have a piece on Tuesday where it's very like, you're pulling the piece as much as possible. So when you get, they gave us ladders, which was very kind of them. Um, you, there are nothing but lines. And I always say this, has anybody ever seen the movie Entrapment with uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones? And she's like going underneath the wires and she's trying to move her body. Anyway, that's how it ended up being. And you're moving a ladder and I'm like, ha, ah, but it needs to go there. Can you bend that way? Like, I mean, it's because it's, you know, it was really hard. Uh, so when people are like, Katie, do you want to do another installation? I'm like, oh, not really. Can I be standing on the floor? Maybe. Uh, I have, you know, this one was about, um, a lot of people like colors, but I, you know, everybody goes through a little thing. I, I couldn't have babies and they gave me like a, the exact number of like what my estrogen level was. I'm like, what? Are you serious? So this is all about like leads to nowhere kind of thing. Um, how long does it take to make a piece? How often do you hear that woodworkers? Right? How long does it take? And if the, how much is it? How long did it take you? So what I, I was in a show and, and they was about time. So I kept stopwatches. Every time I physically touched a piece, physically touched it, not think about it. Um, I timed it. So each one of these has like a, like 15 hours, 29 minutes, 31 seconds, you know, like, and what I was, I should have done is every time you think of a piece, when you're lying in bed, how many times before I, yeah, I should have clipped it and I didn't because then it would have really been like, it took me three weeks to finish this piece. That's really what it was. But to physically touch it, this is how I, this, because it would be like, and I didn't realize how it like all of a sudden, like the click, I'd be like, it's too, <laughs> it's like really like, like get it done. click, okay. Uh, which is also how I don't work, you know, because I'll snag a piece. The anxiety of COVID. Again, a lot of people give you pantyhose and these are silk. Not every pantyhose is the same because you have like the sheer and then you have like the opaque and there's some that are very material based. Material's tough. The more cotton that it has, the more of the stains is even though you think that you've washed them, not bad in certain climates. Humidity is not pantyhose or any material's friends. I did a, you can see it on my website, a piece about this woman's three little angels and it's her old family's onesies. And unfortunately, as an artist, I had to move several times. And after Sandy, I think um, like my basement flooded or something like that. And the onesie stains, even though I had washed them several times and you know, color state bleach, the stains came back. Like they got fuzzy in the spit up areas, weird, right? So when it comes to, um, pantyhose I try to really watch what I buy that's why as much as I love Amazon I hate it because I'm like Ugh, how can you describe pantyhose they're like it's pantyhose not pantyhose. oh and this one ripped and you and I want my money back these are silk hose silk pantyhose will run like that so I knew that there was no way and again somebody had given me a box of them and they're beautiful and they're worth something and they're historical and they're all that jazz but I knew that I couldn't cut them so I had to knot them and it was perfect timing because as the anxiety and the knots of COVID I did a whole series about knots and feeling that kind of like lockdown like you know rah. And it was great. as much I always say I love being unemployed it's the pain that sucks right uh COVID was great to be able to pause and to work and even though every day was like <laughs> it was awesome 
I'm sorry, I was. I lost my dad during COVID because again, lung cancer and all that jazz. And it was terrible, but it was also great because I got a couple moments to like step back and be like, who do you want to be now? Cool, right? Nice. So this is my last one. It's my latest body of work. I haven't even shown it completely yet. It's about baskets and how we compartmentalize. And to me, one of the oldest containers is baskets, right? As much as I want to say it's ceramics, I'm not going to say it. Um, I'm going to say baskets. I know, I'm sorry. I love you guys. You know, you're in my heart, but I, I put you down. Baskets. Okay. So for me, it's about that weaving and it's about that history. And, for, and that's what this body of work is about. Um, the weaving of baskets and kind of the containing of our emotions as well. And so that's my latest body of work. Okay. Any questions? I love questions. Maybe later, find me. All righty. Thank you, everybody. I hope you're as inspired as I am. Hello, and thank you so much for watching this program. Peters Valley would like to thank its sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Peters Valley's channel to receive more like it in the future.